I am Nivedita Indrajit in conversation with Ari Mohan Paru. And today we have a special interviewer, Varati Amarnathan, joining me for some questions. Big fan. So, uh, Hari, you know us. You know yes. we are crazy about you and your work and your, com your company and conversations. Uh, I didn't and, know that. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we never <laughs> really give up <laughs> on conversations with you. At least I know she right. does and I know I do. So, hmm. uh, I know that you are into cricket. I know you write books. I know you, your book has been converted into a movie. And I know you have a blog. And I, I know you have a book which you wrote about your daughter and yourself. So, tell us about your journey. Hmm. How it started for you. Uh, writing journey? Everything. Like, Hari was born. Then, Hari went Hari to college. Born. His yes, life. yes. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. That way. So yeah, I was born in Hyderabad and um, then my father was a state government officer. So I'm the fifth in, a, uh, I've got five other siblings. So I've got a younger brother okay. who's now, who produces movies now. Um, I've got four older sisters. And since my dad was uh, in the state government, we would travel across the state, right? So we went to different uh -huh. places like Nello or Elur and he was in the roads and buildings department. So, uh, I think sometime around the, my seventh class or so, we shifted back to Hyderabad. That was his final posting here. And I guess that's when I think I went to All Saints High School. All Saints High School has a big um, cricketing uh, history. Okay. So, one of, the, one of my main attractions in picking a school then also was cricket. it had to have a cricket ground. So, I was kind of, yeah, interested in the game and, you know, I troubled them. But I... Yeah, I don't know. I think cricket just grew us, grew up on mm. us. And it was always nice to see these, you know, big schools with cricket grounds and you know, hoping to play for the cricket team for the school. And uh, we never had a chance in uh, in the smaller cities, in the smaller towns. So, all since I joined and for the next two years, I was just going and watching the boys play. I mean, uh, coming to Hyderabad was a bit of a cultural shift for us because all the small towns is one thing and Hyderabad and that too, All Saints. All Saints has a very, you know, it's a boys' school and it's a very, and all the boys are quite boisterous and, you know, kind of <laughs> rowdy and it's a rough, um, you know, typical boys' school. And um, uh, so the first two years I never went for the cricket selections or whatever. My 10th class, I went with, um, of course, I needed a lot of courage to go to the selection. So me and another Equally shy boy, uh, both of us held each other's hands and went to the cricket selection. And uh, fortunately, I got selected and he didn't. Okay. Unfortunately for him. Mm. So for me, the first hurdle was passed in a, in a way. And I was in the school team and I thought that was the biggest thing anyone can do. Mm. right? Because you kind of grew up watching all these uh, or reading, um, let's say, Tom Brown school days or reading stuff about... Yeah. Um, them playing all these matches in England and you know, schoolboy cricket. So it was very fanciful for me. And uh, I did quite well. Uh, so, but then suddenly I realized that this cricket team cricket team had some um, state players. Okay. Right? And I didn't know what the state player business was. I didn't, I didn't realize that there was... A, State games happening at under 15 level, and mm. you're always looking at looking up to these guys. Yeah. So I played along with these about four or five of them, and uh, some played for under 19, some played for under 15, and they were, you know, I saw their picture in the Sports Star, so that automatically started a next level, uh, you know, ambition for me. Mm. Wow, you know, I, I would like also like to get into the Sports Star, but I didn't know if I was good enough even to play for the school. So, uh, I won a few games for the school, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I was also very fortunate to, that year, make it to the under-15 uh, Hyderabad State team. Were so, you able to balance your education on this? Was there any challenge about that? So, there was no thinking of, of that. Um, you know, I just would go and play and I was fairly good at the academic side. But this, this would take up a lot of time because you had to go out for practice and the tours would be about 15 days off, right? Yeah. So we did at least two or three such tours. That was the 10th class. So 
anyway i think i just about nearly managed to do a fair fair job you know nothing the high marks but i got through mm. but i think the biggest thing that happened was i played for the state and i played for the south zone and i helped the state team win with you know a vital contribution in the end so i started believing in myself so i think for me one of the biggest things that happened with the game was that uh, you know maybe after i came to hyderabad i was losing confidence in myself you know it was also those growing up years right yeah so um, then um, i think cricket gave me a lot lot of confidence you know suddenly mm. you are part of the school team as part of the state team and people are looking at you like oh, okay man you can do something mm. so then i went for the south zone um, there's a coaching camp was organized by the bcci etc etc mm-hmm. then um, so the, and this is also how it goes you know your cricketing journey so a lot of kids uh, may not be aware that this is the route to actually go and play for the state so you play for when i played for the school i mean that i played we, our school team had a league team you have to okay. play in the league championship okay so the league championship is a sunday league so every sunday we are playing against teams which are much much older cricketers Hmm. and um, you know our performances are reported in the newspaper so people get to see how you're doing how your team's doing and uh, selectors watch all that and a good performance there or in the school championship get you pulled on hmm. so i did all that and went ahead but then after i passed out of school i did not have a team i mean to have a team you have to go and ask people and it's not like you automatically get called so i was again as usual thinking i'll give up on cricket and go back and you know sit in my back benches um which is when the, this very good friend of mine we played the under 15 uh, you know state and south zone together uh, with you with you jaisima okay. so with you jaisima was the son of uh, the former test cricketer you know ml jaisima mm. who lived in hyderabad and he said well, what are you doing wasting your life come and play for mcc now mcc was a i was playing for the b division league. Okay. MCC and eight A division league team, and it had all these stars like Jaisman. Like they were like so big that you couldn't even imagine that you can go and sit in the same dressing room with them. Mm. Like, do you think I'm good enough to actually play for that? And uh, of course, and uh, you know, we did that. We had a very good eye because he not only picked me, he picked uh, Venkat Pati Raju later, who was who went on to play for India, and and it was this wonderful team uh, where with you. then there's vivek jaisima and you know a lot of uh, aspiring cricketers and some very experienced cricketers so i did fairly well that year and the next year i did so well that um, i was catapulted into the under 19 then the under 22 then the under 25 so i played all i mean everything but the ranji trophy that year so this okay. is my second year intermediate okay um, coming on really good solid you know match winning performances with big teams mm. so um, suddenly i was uh, one one step shy of the ranji trophy mm. and um yeah, i mean at home i had a lot of support especially from my mom i think my dad wasn't very sure where this would all lead me uh, lead me to and he was always concerned that i was spending a lot of time with uh, cricket so um, while this intermediate thing was going on he wanted me to you know he wanted me to uh, do mpc because i could try an engineering you know exam and all that stuff i wasn't keen on that even then for some reason i was always telling him i want to do english literature you know some stuff like that so some escapist angle was there escapist yes, so did uh, you know you were good with that <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know it was Must good be. other than other I than mean, reading maybe not cognitively perhaps but maybe it you are leaning towards it although yeah, yeah, i would i would write i would write and i would get an essay you know one one essay prize i would i'd win a one, one competition but i think great you know typical school school stuff but i like the fact that i could sit away and not get into this uh, world of competition so which is kind of odd because you're playing cricket and you're out there and otherwise i was quite happy being in my corner so yeah so he wanted me to do so he made me do this mpc and then all that stuff and um, so i did fairly well that year and i don't know if you realized how uh, you know how much i had progressed in the last couple of years but that same year i think um after the engineering entrance and all that um, he passed away he passed away he had an accident and he passed away. he was already retired by then 
and um, only one of my sisters was married at that time. So three of my older sister was still unmarried, and my mom was suddenly left uh, taking care of the whole bunch. And um, anyway, we just uh, the, the the funny or the ironic aspect was that um, what I couldn't get through with the regular entrance, I got uh, an engineering seat through the sports quota. So that, that okay. Okay. So that, that would have been like, okay, you didn't waste your time. Right. Oh. So, but anyway, it passed on and I got civil, which was also his branch. He was a civil engineer and all that. So I went back to engineering. Somewhere during the engineering time, I, uh, second year engineering, I was when I got to play uh, Ranji Trophy. Okay. Um, which then, year was uh, this? 80, so 84, 85, 85, 86. Okay. So 85, 86, it was typically the Ranji Trophy season spills over from October to February. Like that. Mm -hmm. So I was playing again for the same team, Marit Pali Cricket Club, playing with all these uh, stalwarts. So I, my learning was accelerated, just being with them, listening to Mr. Jai Sima, or list, you know, just watching these guys play. So I did a fairly, uh, I had a fairly good debut. I got one wicket and four wickets on debut, which is good. You know, five, oh, awesome. five wickets. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. And pretty good spell. So people started talking, hey man, you know, a very good spell. One of my best spells, I think, in my life. Then I got two or three. So the first season, I ended up with some 12 or 13 wickets. And um, I got another four, four wicket haul against Goa. And um, then we did, uh, I did something very, uh, very stupid. I mean, today when you look back, um, uh, when I look back, see what happened, uh, I'll come back to this. So what happened was I got this 12 wicket haul, 12 wickets in the first year, which is fairly good. Mm. Um, people were saying, okay, man, we, you have a choice. In fact, I was in the standby for the South Zone and all that stuff. So I, I did a fairly, a fairly good job. Now, at this point of time, what I did was I shifted my team from the team which was teaching me so much and you know allowing me to go higher and higher and um, promoting me. And I think whatever I played at higher levels was probably because Mr. Jay Small also um, saw some potential and maybe put in a word here and there. But uh, I changed my team and went to play for the Usmania University, okay. which is the which is the a terrible team to uh, play for for a fast bowler because it's it's one of the flattest wickets in Hyderabad. Okay. So for a bowler, it's not a good wicket to, especially for a fast bowler. Okay. So it's like almost committing suicide, you know, my career. Mm. So I <laughs> I went there. I was the biggest fish in the pond. Uh, maybe all that was good for my ego, but uh, it was very bad for my game. My game dipped very badly, hmm. and I played two more games that year. And after that, I was dropped and dropped out of the 15 straight away. Now, at that point of time, of course, um, I I was uh, disappointed. But you know, when I look back today, I, I think I was more relieved than disappointed because I was like, things were happening too fast. And yeah. uh, you know, if I just continued further, my at that same pace, you know, I would have gone to the next level, which is like, you know, for me, I just couldn't process all this stuff, what the hell is mm. happening. Mm. So maybe I just cut that whole thing down, went back to some comfort zone. And I never went back. I just, mm. I never really went back. I just, I, in fact, I remember my coach, um, when Mr. Sampath is no more. In fact, he's the, he's the guy on which I named the coach's name in my first novel. Mm. So he, um, and this guy is committed. He actually came all the way to the engineering college and after his drop, on me out in the canteen and said, you give me one year of your time and I'll see that you play chess cricket. And that kind of commitment he had. Of course, I didn't have the same kind of commitment. Okay. I just went back, did my engineering and uh, played for the universities and that kind of stuff, but never went back. Hmm. Today, I mean, just to end this particular story, today when we, when uh, for many years, in fact, a lot of people would say, and I even I started uh, telling the same story that man, there's too many politics and, you know, how come they could drop you and all that kind of stuff. But today, when I look back, I say it's not, there's nothing to do with politics. I just wasn't playing well. In fact, if I go even deeper, I completely sabotaged my own career because I didn't know how to handle it. You know, I didn't know um, to ask for help. I didn't know. Today, if I was in the same position and if I was dropped, I would always try to come back, you know, and go out on um, high or yeah. on my terms. I wouldn't mm. go out on their terms. 
right right and which is what i failed to do at that time but that's okay and um, yeah i mean that kind of went off uh, i think given the way. circumstances in that period and time i think even mentoring of that area was not so uh, flourished as much as it is today as in yeah, the time but, uh, of but like i said you made, know right? but you know this mentoring thing can't happen if the student is not ready correct so if, also, if my coach came, yeah if my coach came all the way to college and say i'll do this for you or i had probably the best mentor anyone could ever get mr jaisama you know one phone call away or one visit away and in fact he actually said something like that you know he actually told me once why he caught me on the road and he said just after i got dropped he said life's not just about you know yesterday and today he said there's always a tomorrow Mm-hmm. and i was like i just didn't understand what what that meant so i said i actually told him yeah, uncle i don't understand this maybe time in my life i hope i understand but i think he was trying to tell me ki look i mean just don't give up and you know this always tomorrow and you can do something today to get back yeah. uh, which i did so um, that kind of uh, ended that uh, the cricket story mm-hmm. but i today i take full responsibility for that and i feel i didn't have perhaps the right mindset so many times we have that that several people with great talent um but you don't have the mindset to see it through so for me i think that's what we lack i think it's that. also more about the uh, journey of that period you know it's like whether you want to really go a different path or whether you want to have a balance and maybe comfortable with who you can be at that point of time today we can always go back and judge that is a bad choice but back then maybe that's a capacity and that's a choice ah uh, but it's a choice taken out of um, i felt fear yeah not a choice you know that maybe i you were too excited have. yeah i know i mean like uh-huh. you this mental thing like a lot of sports persons they say right it's not only talent talent needs to have that equal amount of mental uh, agility right. and commitment to hit the big level i mean you can play till the level especially yes, yes. when you bring up on the chapter the cricket chapter of your life but um, i don't know whether you touched upon it before but i i know you, one of the highlights at least when you told me about your career was your winning being part of the winning ranji trophy team so what was your experience do you consider that as the high or the high point of your career and definitely high point because uh, hyderabad only won twice you know uh, once in 1934 and once in 86 87 when we played i didn't play the final I, in fact i didn't play most of the se- season i played only for the first two games um after the second game i was dropped and uh, after that i went back to studying but the um, fact remains that we were part of the campaign and uh, we the 17 of us who were part of the campaign that year and all of us get felicitated and you know we all seen as a team and uh, whether we played the final or not we take a lot of pride in <laughs> what we did and the first two games that i played i felt yeah so that was we definitely part of that uh, that part of history and um yeah apart from that i mean uh, like i was saying uh, this didn't come like one fluke um several of us who were part of that team for the, for years before you know like i was part of winning teams in under 15 under 19 under 22 25 and there is a tournament called buchi babu and this mm. you know all these you know so by pile so we won all these titles so this whole bunch of people who were doing well and who were winning uh, tournaments and you know we kind of fed off each other and it culminated in winning the ranji trophy which is a huge thing uh, of course what when i look back i said wow how come we never won it again we should have actually won it a few more times but that is the last we ever won the ranji trophy and i don't we couple of times i think we went to the finals um yeah but definitely one of the big things uh, that i take credit for despite not playing the final in, you know yeah yeah but it is a team like i, mean, I like everybody says in teams there are stars but unless there is a team there is no star to perform also so i think everybody contributes in a team game oh yes 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 so that i think is very clear so we all all did our part we all felt very happy when we won and <laughs> so that's that we still talk about it i think that's one thing that comes across in cricket you know all the teams that we were part of and which won all those years ago like recently the university team which won 1990 uh, 
uh, we had won the South Indian universities. We all met after 29 years. And it's still, you know, such a wonderful story. And we won, I think we won after some 10 years or so. So it is a big thing for us. And it was the weakest team that we took. So it is a huge thing. And uh, actually, yeah, I'm actually writing about it now. It was a very interesting story. David versus Goliath types like a week. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Mm. Yeah, I think India also at the time cricketing, we were also going through the whole change, right? 83, we won the World Cup. I think 85, we won the other series, right? The other series, I forgot the right. name. Right, yeah, several series. So we were mm. also making a stamp on the international. Benson and Hedges, yeah, Benson right. Hedges, um, Benson, yeah. right. We won the Audi car. <laughs> No, uh, the other thing was also like, you know, I personally am very fascinated by fast bowlers within cricket more than batsmen. Mm-hmm. I like the bowlers and in within bowlers, I love really fast bowlers, but they all carry a very aggressive persona, like from the West Indians right. to the Australians. I know Indians naturally mm-hmm. might not, but we are, even the Pakistani fast bowlers like uh, Ayo Akram right. and uh, Imran. I mean, all of them are like super aggressive with the swag and all the stuff like, you know, scare the batsman off and, you know, so right. was that also your persona or what kind of No, no, no. So uh, I was very uh, gentle, non-confrontational. Um, like I, my, my belief was my skill should speak. So I was more into thinking that guy out than, you know, um, playing mind games with them. So, um, yeah, what, whatever aggression would show, maybe in bowling a couple of bouncers or, you know, doing stuff like that. But, not, I mean, no sledging or no overt aggression. Um, in fact, in one of my job interviews, I remember one of the guys, the HR guy, was like, oh, you're a fast bowler. And, oh, that means you're aggressive. And um, so we had this discussion. I said, I don't know what, for me, aggression is not. In, so the same con, the same. Yeah question, you know, so I was telling him that I don't believe in that aggression is inside, you know. Aggression is chosen outcome, not, not in you know, jumping around there. I mean, that's what I used to think. Yeah, no, so, I mean, like, you have different, like, I think, like, like you're talking, you're like Srinath and all are not so aggressive, but pretty, yeah. like, you know, they make sure that the uh, wickets talk. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah the very, like, we, I'd like to differentiate between just aggression uh, as in an overt way versus being very competitive. So we were definitely competitive. We definitely wanted to win. We do everything to win. Um, but by playing, you know, the game and using our skill and that, I mean, that's what I built to me then. Uh, so I wasn't... Sorry, go ahead. No, finish. Hari, what were you saying? Yeah, no, just to sum it up. So I wasn't that overt, aggressive guy, you know, in their face kind of uh, a fast bowler. Yeah. yeah. In one of your stories, you are also mentioned that you did not choose fast bowling. Like you kind of fast bowling kind of select chose you. Oh, yes, so look, yes, yes. Looking yes. back, how do you like India pitches are not far fast. I know you got the height and everything, but do you think if you hmm. had to go back, would you change your choice or you still go for fast bowling? Uh, I don't know. Um, fast bowling is the toughest fight. Yeah. You know, it's it's a labor class. I feel of in the cricket, uh, you know, hierarchy. Yeah, especially so I in feel India. Anywhere, you know, the batsmen are the, the rajas, Darling. Darling. and then the bowlers are the guys who are doing all the hard work. And in the bowlers, of course, the spinners seem to have a, a more gentler job because the fast bowlers are it's it's real hard work. You know. You have to run and the action, everything puts a lot it's of stress. The shine on your of body. the ball, so many stuff. Ah, there's a lot. You no, know, apart from that, it's very tough because uh, there's a lot of injuries because you know you're not speed. I think the bodies are not bodies not made to for bowling action, and several bowling actions are not very good. The pitches are hard. Over a long period of time, you carry a lot of injuries on yourself. So to use fast bowling is almost like a masochistic, uh, you know, this thing. And of course, some people are just chosen as fast bowlers because their physique, uh, you know, is taller, they're stronger, and stuff like that. And I, yeah, like uh, if I if I was given the choice, I mean, if I or if I had the um, you know courage to say, okay, I, I would like to be a batsman more than anything else, you know, and maybe maybe bowl a little. 
who were your favorite fast bowlers like who at that time inspired you or you looked up to like Oh, I think Michael Holding was one. Dennis Lilly was one. In fact, I learned a lot of the craft from. There's a book one of my sisters had gifted to me when I was in my tenth class, when I first played for my school. So there's this book called The Art of Fast Bowling. Dennis Lilly had written that book. I remember reading it and you know, kind of practicing almost everything that I could, you know, skill wise. And uh, so he was definitely one of my uh, biggest. Richard Hadley was one, uh, so yeah. If you, Imran Khan was one. Uh, MRF uh, is run by Lily or Hadley? MRF. Uh, they have an academy, right? So Fast bowling academy. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So Lily was associated with it for a yeah, long time, right? Yeah. Great, Nivedita. I think <laughs> if we talk cricket, we'll talk for a very long time. So. Nivedita. Can you hear us, Nivedita? Nivedita. I think her internet is not. So mm. anyway, we'll continue then, uh, Hari. So the next okay. chapter, now the cricket is done. Okay, so yeah, the cricket, so it went into the background, you know, from uh, where it had uh, completely over, uh, overtaken my life. Uh, but I think what it did was it gave me a lot of confidence. I learned so much more from the game. Um, you know, just playing with so many different people uh, of different backgrounds and all of us trying to achieve something together. And all of them have different mindsets. So, uh, and for me, I think what's fascinating about the game was that, you know, when we, uh, today we try to bring cricket scenarios, let's say, into the corporate world or into any kind of, and of course, a lot of them say, hey, that's cricket and this is corporate and this is different. But for me, it's like the, the, what we did is, let's say you play a one-day game. So using a bunch of resources, you're trying to get a particular result. So in the, in, in the, in the, at the end of the day, you know exactly what happened or what you did right or what you didn't do right. Whereas, let's say in the corporate uh, thing, you would probably go for a year and not really figure out what went right or wrong. The same dynamics work. So for me, so you that that is. Do workshops with cricket and uh, the corporate uh, uh, workshops based on cricket, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. So I felt it's a easy way to convey certain principles which work both ways. You know, which work everywhere. It's universal. So it's not like only cricket will. Um, it's applicable only on the cricket field. So if uh, something, let's say, as simple as uh, having a common purpose, so which which many cricket teams also don't have. You know, it's a very unsaid thing that we would like to win. Nobody, very few captains put it out there and say, "Yes, we are here to win." So there's a big difference between this and that. So I'm saying the same same things hold here or there. So the writing start happening for publishing and uh, um, yeah, okay. So to continue the journey, then what but happened? An investment banker, no, for 10 years. Right. So, so I did my engineering, then I did my MBA because my I didn't want to do an engineering job finally, primarily. Uh, first thing, because I didn't learn much of engineering. I was playing too much cricket. Then, then I did my MBA, that's where I met Shoba. And um, she was doing finance, I was doing marketing. Then I decided, I think, um, to kind of move away from cricket and make a career out of my academics, perhaps. I, I think that was, a, again, kind of shows how um, kind of warped my thinking was because it is weird because I would make out uh, resumes and it would have a lot of cricket in it because that was one of my bigger achievements in life. And of course, enough about academics. And then the interviewers would say, looks like you're very interested in cricket, you know, and I would feel a little, oh, maybe I shouldn't talk so much about cricket. So 10 lines would become five lines and it became one line. And, but when I look back, I said, man, that's something that was very special. It's just very unique to you. So instead of hiding it, I could have actually put it forward and said, look, I know how to win. I know how to play with teams. I know how to lead a side and all these things, which none of these guys know. So I was trying to compete with these other guys on uh, in the academic front which is not my strong point 
and I was trying to dilute my strong point, which was cricket and what I learned from it, or stuff like that. So anyway, I went and I worked for for a few companies before I picked up uh, banking. Banking was where I spent almost 12, 12, um, 10 years. Investment, investment banking as in, it was an investment bank. I was, yeah, I was in business development and stuff. But I did, I dealt a lot with corporate finance for 10 years. How did you get into writing from the finance world? Okay. Mm -hmm. So 10 years of corporate finance, but uh, yeah, like my uh, training was in marketing. So what did I do? I was fond of writing anyway. So, so I think while I was at the bank, I started dabbling with this freelance uh, writing articles for newspapers, you know, just to see. Uh, and I got published in one small little newspaper and I got very happy with this thing that somebody's publishing and he would publish and he'd never pay, of course. But I'd write articles and, you know, some funny articles and stuff like that. Um, lifestyle based stuff. Then um, I think while I was still in the bank, I remember reading one really bad novel, one Indian writer. That is when Indian writing in English was coming up a little more because Indian publishing, I think, took off in the 90s. And I read this really bad novel and I said, okay, if this fellow can write and get published, I can also get published. So I said, and I started, I wrote my first novel then. That never got published even today, but I'm still working at it. Uh, then I wrote another one. Uh, then I wrote another one. The fourth one got published finally. So the on record four books are the, not the only books you wrote. Four or no, five? No, there's so many. Uh, five today, including one biography that was commissioned that I did last year. Yeah. So. So this writing process has been interesting in the sense that there's, I, have, I don't have any training other than reading books and stuff like that. I have, I'm zero training, zero um, idea about how publishing works. So um, what I did was I wrote, wrote a book and I sent it. And of course they rejected very fast. So I got the rejection letter very fast. But then you write a big story and you think you put your heart out and you put your entire life out and you know, you, you think it's your masterpiece and you know, in two, in two days you'll get a rejection letter. It's very tough in the initial years. And of course, I, I mean, now we read about so many of, so many writers who actually kill themselves because of the rejection, because uh, you are in a way putting a lot of yourself out when you write um, a story or whatever. So, but we were, I mean, I was very thick skinned that perhaps, or maybe that's what fast bowlers are made of. So. I said, I always thought that something is wrong with them. I never thought something is wrong with my, my book. I kept on approaching people and people and then maybe much later I realized, okay, maybe this book is not working. Maybe I should write another book. And then I wrote another bunch of short stories and uh, even that didn't get published. So for a short while, one, <laughs> there was this guy called uh, Senu George. Okay, he, was, he used to run a small publishing house in I don't know how I got his address and I sent it to him and he said, man, we're doing this. I thought I landed the biggest, you know, publishing deal. Nothing. This is zero. He just sent me a contract and we were both so thrilled with the whole idea. Then that went nowhere. You know, by the end of it, actually, Senu got into a lot of trouble and I was ending up counseling him and all kinds of stuff was going on. But, that, but anyway, I'm glad that Senu came into my life because um, that was when I quit my job and decided to write full time. So, okay, uh, this is also something that I get asked about. You know, how come you left a job and you wrote when you don't have a multi-million uh, deal on your table? So for me, it was how was it? Um, yeah, I think one one thing was there's all we always keep thinking, right? That why don't we follow our passion and stuff like that? So at that time, I felt, okay, maybe I should follow this passion and see how it turns out. Uh, you could, I could do my work and I could do this, but I felt I'll never do justice. You know, if both, I, I, I thought I'll burn the bridges first and see how 
how good or how bad it is. And um, yeah, I mean, that's it. I just burned the bridge and I said, okay, let's see what happens. And so that's when the Senu guy came into my life. And uh, so I'm glad for that he was there. And uh, yeah, another thing I think that job uh, business um, was that it was getting too, I really felt that life was getting too comfortable. And if I uh, stay in that comfort zone and, you know, get more and more used to this comfort, so I'd never do anything because I'll get used to having one house and one EMI or a bigger car. And then a few years down the line, it'd be more difficult for me to step away. So I said, okay, let me take this call right now. And, and not a moment of regret, frankly. I mean, after that, it's been like complete growth because every day is a new day. Not like I end of the day, I'll end of the month, I'll get a salary check or I'm assured of promotions or nothing like that. So I got to learn things, I got to figure out things and stuff like that. So, yeah. I think uh, even Shobha was working uh, on her own and moved into uh, business at that point of time or therapy work and all that. And you were also doing this, right? Hmm. Or is it at a different time frame? Um, yeah, around the same time, I guess. I yeah, think Shobha, Shobha started before. Shobha started, I think, a little before uh, I took off. Uh, she was also working in some finance companies and for a while she was in yeah. software and all that stuff. But then she moved into her own, you know, this counseling and uh, these workshops. Then I took a call and she was very supportive. She didn't say, okay, okay man, you got to earn. She was, I mean, she's always been very... Uh, very clear that fine, whatever we have, we'll get by with that. So that gave me, I mean, that took a lot of pressure off me. And um, so I just wrote and, and then I went with whatever happened. So I wrote first, second, the third book, then the fourth. And again, I was trying very hard not to do anything that's connected to cricket. So I wanted to be seen as a person with more dimensions. So I wrote one romance, I wrote one semi-biographical, philosophical book, which never got published. I wrote children's stories, nothing got published. And the fourth story was what I thought was a simple cricket story of a school. And this was some, I think somebody gave me the idea. They said, why don't you write about a, a school fiction? And I said, okay, I never had school fiction when I was growing up. So let me write one school fiction, but I'll put a little more thought into it, not just you know, like a simple story. So I tried to put a lot of management stuff and, you know, how to win and how to, uh, you know, get the team together, that, that kind of stuff, you know, a little bit of whatever else I learned from the game. Was that the and, one that got into a movie? that got Yeah, yeah, in? right. Correct. So High that, School. Yeah. So that book was called Men Within. Yeah. Men Within and it's called uh, Picketing Tales. It's a very simple story. I thought, okay, some kids will read it and, you know, that's the end of the story. Um... So after it came out funnily, uh, and this is how these things work. So this friend of mine who, is a, who was the president of the Hyderabad Management Association, he read the book and he said, man, this has a lot of uh, stuff for leadership and team building and all that. Uh, oh, his name is Amar. And Amar was like, you, you should come and give a lecture in the HMA meeting. And he gave me a two hour you know, slot. And I have never spoken for more than five minutes. So I had to go back and, and he wouldn't let me get off. He would like, no, you have to come and talk. And these are all big professionals. And I always felt like a fraud talking in terms of these professionals. Said, okay, fine. Anyway, I went, prepared, prepared for a whole week. And which is what I wrote in the book. Oh, so I kind of followed my own book and my own advice. And for I wrote the entire script and read for about every day I'd eat for two or three times. So I did a one hour talk for about nine, nine, so one week into three. So 21, 21 times I went and delivered the talk. So what happened with the talk was that suddenly people started saying, okay, you can come and talk here. And one person asked me to do a workshop based around it. And suddenly one new uh, revenue stream started for me, uh, lectures and you know workshops in colleges, in um, corporates, stuff like that. Uh, it, it, 
So you, sorry, now you said you had fear of public speaking and all in one of our discussions. Yes, yes. So how did you embrace this new career then, <laughs> which is I, all about I talking? Didn't, I didn't embrace it. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the Amar pushed it into my arms and I couldn't do not uh, take it up. So, so the moment I realized I couldn't escape, that's when I said, okay, how do I do this? Then I wrote the entire script and, you know, read it out, read it out, read it out. And, so, and that's the only way to get over that, which is a public speaking business. So, yeah, I mean, so Has I- Has it gotten become it's... easier now that you've been doing for quite a few years? It's still yeah, 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 yeah. No, but every time you still feel a little, you know, but you're much easier now. So I, in fact, the other day I just gave a five minute talk in some school function where I was asked to be the chief guest. And my friend was like, hey man, you know, did you just make it up on stage? And I was telling a peak, you know, and I was, <laughs> even for these five minutes, I, I kept, you know, I wrote down some notes and made a lot of points. I said, but what I think we've realized over time is to make it look like we're just Effortless, thinking it up on yeah. stage. <laughs> yeah. But, Acting with uh, the public speaking. Ah, right. So I think that that happens. Yeah. But what happened was, I think, uh, I, I like, uh, when I put my heart and soul into this men within I realized, and I think it's become one of my principles in life. You put your heart and soul into any one aspect of your life. I feel that kind of gives you the energy to connect all the other aspects of your life which you felt were wasted. So for me, it connected back to, let's say, my investment banking, which a lot of people say, hey, well, that's all gone waste. But no, I mean, there's so much I learned about investment banking. Like today, if I do a workshop in a company, I'm in a superb position to see from an MD's point of view. Because right. in the investment bank, we'd always talk from the MD's point of view. So my MBA didn't go waste, or my engineering didn't go waste, or my... Even your game. Yeah, nothing went waste. So I felt, you know, wow, this is very nice. It's connecting everything back. And uh, yeah, so that was the first year. I mean, that getting that published was on big relief for me because like for so many years I'm saying I'm writing, I'm writing and there's nothing to show. Finally one small publisher took it, published it and um, it did fairly well. And then next year my brother picked it up. He said, okay, I'm going to, not next year, two years later. Next year he produced his first movie, which is a hit movie in Telugu called Lashta Chama. Then, and he said, okay, I want to do this movie. And then he did it and made it into Golconda High School. So we announced Golconda High School at exactly the same time when my second book was ready. This was my romance. The one that I was hoping to, you know, <laughs> uh, get published and get away from my cricketing story. So I wrote the romance, the romance got published. Um, and for a long time, nothing got published. I started doing so many other things and all my ideas were uh, not uh, taken seriously or rejected or whatever. Um, then, of course, um, one publisher told me, uh, you know, instead of writing all this, uh, you know, I, was, I think I was trying to do a lot of self-helpish work based on my workshop uh, in terms of writing. So she said, why don't you write about 100 lessons from cricket or something like that. And I said, oh, it's the easiest thing for me to do, you know. So I, and then I realized another insight for me was the things that are easiest to us is I think we don't seem to see and everybody else seems to be able to see that. And for me, it was like the when she suggested, I said, ah, that's an easy thing to do. And I said, why aren't you doing it? So that's how 50 Not Out, uh, my third book came out. And 50 Not Out um, was, I think, 2015. So it's about 50 lessons I learned from the game. That, I think, was probably my most successful book in terms of numbers sold because a lot of corporate guys bought it and as a corporate gift for their employees and stuff like that. And then I think uh, this idea about Anjali's book came. So, you know, I used to write, I used to blog about her. Um, very interesting stuff. So I would blog and then I was looking out for uh, interesting stuff to write on the blog. And there's nothing more interesting than seeing a, or watching a child you know, doing things. She was growing up and I would watch her and I would, um, I think I would more initially for the blog, I would ask her a few questions. Why did you do this? And when I asked those questions, she would actually say something very, very profound. And uh, which I think all kids do if we listen to them. 
if he actually is yeah. yeah so we don't i mean my i thought listening to her was kind of selfish for my blog <laughs> then i kind of realized okay man she is actually saying so and i became a bit of a habit you what what is she thinking and what is she saying and i would try to capture them and then when i try to relate that to all my other learnings let's say from the workshops that shobha would do and i would attend um then i said hey, they are saying this pretty much the same thing you know so these are things that these kids seem to be fully equipped with you know whether it's forgiveness or non judgmental being non judgmental or, or just having no limitation in their mind so many things that we struggle as adults they seem to be like completely fully equipped with and uh, so it is a fantastic learning in, in, in terms of learning i feel that's probably the best book for me and um, yeah it was very nice i mean every single blog i would ask her can i write about you can i write about this and sometimes she would you know when she was 6 7 she would correct me and say no i didn't mean that i meant this <laughs> so that was very interesting so even when i when the idea of a book came and the publisher agreed i asked her and i asked shobha and it would be okay and they were okay so that came out and of course i did one uh, biography that's a it's a commissioned work my friend and my senior dr shridhar so he passed away um, in a uh, few years ago he was quite young and he was a cricketer and you know very good cricketer and a very good friend also so his family asked me to write his life so that was also very interesting to meet so many people also look at his facets from their perspectives so that's how the joining uh, writing journey is been are there any future books that you're writing although you don't have to name it any future books I yeah think. yeah several so one of my, my first book that i never never got published <laughs> i'm not going to let that go so i'm going to keep writing it um and i have uh, uh, ideas for about 6 to 7 books i mean all of them have begun in a way i also f- have this idea of compiling all my um the stuff i wrote for my columns you know and compiling them and making them into a book publishing them so yeah, i have interesting columns they come on monday mornings ha ah, so that also yeah so seven or eight ideas i have for books so i need to take them one by one and right so i i don't think i'll ever suffer from a lack of an idea for a book so i would i just like to finish them one by one and write more you know as i can have you, have you did you ever experience writer's block in your career so far and if writer's yes how block, you overcame it actually no really not uh, block as in no block i mean not But, but that way, you know, I'm not like. Though I call myself a full-time writer, I'm not a full-time writer because I do so many other things. So, but I, 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 like I go and do these workshops in corporates. I lecture in colleges. I lecture in the University of Hyderabad. That's something I really enjoy doing. Because I lecture, I take one course called Art Management in the University of Hyderabad for uh, the Department of Dance. and oh. this there is dancers um, who are doing their masters of performing arts course and they are primarily kuchipudi and bharatanatyam dancers and this is a second year course which is to help them uh, manage their career better so few years ago the dean uh, at that time i think the head of the department uh, dr anuradha jundalagada she asked approached me and said look we have this course and we haven't been able to you know deliver it as well as we thought so i said okay i mean i'm a writer and i'm also trying to manage my career so maybe i can add value but the only thing i asked is just let me give me a free hand and i'll do whatever so it's evolved very well i mean i am very thrilled with that so there there not too many uh, students it's, it ranges between 10 to 15 but i'm very thrilled with you know they are, it, i can see it in their eyes that it seems to make a difference um so yeah so i do several things uh, write this column write this so i don't maybe if a writer is only writing a book and get stuck I, that could be a mental block but i am like you know doing so many dabbling in so many things so so far no but there are times when i'm writing let's say a novel or some place where mm-hmm. one idea seems to be 
kind of stuck and uh, you're not able to express it well um that's when um, you know some it suddenly comes to you right so while you're walking or you're doing something else one flash and then it makes sense what would you recommend if somebody uh, wants to start off writing as a career and how would one start and i mean we've had your journey of course but what would you recommend one versus recommend in so like if somebody first wants to become a writer and they would like writer as in a no, as in a novelist you mean it could be a novel as in a novelist could be a non fiction anything book writer somebody wants to write books yeah i mean so so the first thing is you got to get down and write yeah which is i think a lot of place where a lot a lot of people don't uh, get down to writing and um, so a lot of people have ideas and they say oh i'm not very good or i would like to write but the thing is you have to get it down on the paper number one and once you get it down on the paper you can get an evaluation done uh, figure out how good you are and how you no know, what if it's if you're already good and if you already like know like yeah you can uh, there are so many editors out there you can help look into the yeah. work so okay. once you write and normally you write and you you have to write it to an extent where you are completely completely satisfied that it's the final product or almost the best you can do mm. so you can't just do one very hazy sketchy draft and hope somebody will take it forward okay. because nobody has the time frankly in fact Mm, one of the things that always comes up especially with people who uh, write novels is, is first time writers they say man if i send it to a publisher will they steal my idea the thing is nobody is looking to steal your idea in, in fact no after, after a few times you you actually want to pay them to read your stuff you know instead of trying to hide it from them <laughs> because nobody actually has the time to even read your stuff so who's going to steal your idea right so you got to really put your heart and soul get the first solid draft out um you can send it to an editor or there's a lot of people who will evaluate it agents are there you can meet uh, you can uh, send it to them and once you get an evaluation done if it's really good you're on because they'll uh, some publisher will pick it up or the agent will sell it or whatever if uh, it's not there yet what they will do is they will su- suggest changes which means you'll have to go back and work at it and um, like any craft so you will get better as you write more and more and whatever exposure you've had whatever training you've had so far uh, maybe even your life experience will help you write it you know as as well as you can you know, there has to be a lot of honesty all these things have you can't try to become a star i think i would like to look at it uh, as a like way a where you yeah where you I mean, I think at end of the day, writers write because they are trying to make sense of the world. So the kind of topics we choose are to make them clearer. Because when I write it, it I become a world. not so much. But I, when I write about a particular topic, it becomes clearer to me. You're okay. I'm making sense of myself. So let's say I write a semi-autobiographical story. I'm making self a sense of myself. What does this and mean to me? What does this mean? It has to be mean? universal, also. Yes, and typically, if you are very honest with yourself you will connect at the at a universal level um so you have to you will figure that out as you go on the journey where you are being dishonest to yourself where you are being honest to yourself what is your comfort you know what how you will write how you will improve your craft uh, how you will get rid of stuff which is not you all this stuff happens along the way and meeting people getting rejected getting humbler getting clearer so all this happens so typically but let us say you um, uh, to give a uh, more clearer answers they say if, if however big your novel is or a book is they say don't take more than 90 days on getting the first draft out so mm. 90 days you just write whatever it is and get a get it into some shape then you go back and work work at it and you refine it refine it refine it refine it and typically what happens at one stage when you feel you have done enough they actually say distance yourself from the book and it makes sense because you get uh, caught up with some characters you get caught up with some lines you get caught up with some endings and uh, ideas yeah so until 
you would dis distance yourself you will be always defending that mm. so they say almost three months to six months you keep it away and you do something else then you go back to it and then you will see that maybe it can be done differently mm. and of course the agents editors publishers you approach mm, now what they do is typically let's say you go to a publisher let's say you get to a publisher if they like the idea they will give you a contract and they will give you a contract typically it's on a royalty basis and um, they'll start around 7% go up to 12% or so or maybe more i don't know but 7 to 12 is a common thing and this they pay yearly or quarterly or whatever but most people pay yearly um, if it's a fantastic book and an agent is very good they'll get you great advances but normally most of our books are like they'll give an advance to cover against sales so they'll give you some normal nominal advance of 50000 or whatever and it goes off so and after that is a long process because uh, you, with the publisher taking it is one process after that again then they assign an editor to you the editor will sit with you and you know bit by bit we process the entire thing they will suggest changes you can change them etc 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 and together we had arrive at a particular ending now this whole thing may take another year with the editor and all that stuff and after that they will put it on a list they have a yearly list then at some point it gets published then you do some something to market it and all that kind of stuff and uh, <laughs> that's another long long story you still have to promote your own book and do, do your bit to help see it out in the world uh, for those people who let's say uh, whose books are getting made into movies and all so one experience i have had and which i can share straight away is um a book can be made into several languages uh can go into several medium so it can become a film it can go become a film in 100 languages it can become a tv series in so many things uh, so all these are so if we sell it off and if we just sell the whole thing at one go then You, you then you are stuck then that's a bad deal so ideally you should um, sell it for a particular language sell it for a particular medium be very clear about that because tomorrow let's say a bengali guy wants to make it and you sell it separate but if you sell it off to the first guy that comes he will resell it so many times that you you know the... so basically yeah. you need to get the uh, ownership deal correct and yeah, so yeah, yeah. parts of the ownership you're giving and what are your royalties and yeah keep your eyes and ears coming. open right talk to people get some ideas and then sign the dotted line mm -hmm. thank you so much for this conversation do you have any more questions one thing no oh, i'm good on that okay thank you so All much right. thanks thank you Hare. thanks, thanks. nivi for having me over <laughs> bye